on Amendment 19 to Clause 6, with which we were discussing Amendments 20, 21 and Duke Clause 3. Question again proposed that the amendment be made. I call Gloria de Piero to conclude that debate. Uh, thank you, and it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, the Minister had just concluded his remarks, and I, was, I had started the sentence saying that we are going to move to a division on all of them. Amendment 19, proposed for clause 6, as on the amended paper. The question is that the amendment be made. As many as I have been say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. 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 I think the ayes have it. Aye. No. no. Division. No. Division. Six and the nose nine, so the nose have it unlocked. <laughs> Amendment twenty proposed to clause six as on the amended paper. The question is that the amendment be made. As many of the opinions say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. 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 I think the uh, no's have it. Aye. Or aye. division. Green? No. David Hansen? No. Peter Heaton Jones? No. Scott Mann? No. Amanda Milling? No. Fiona Onasanya? Aye. Ellie Reeves? Aye. Joe Stevens? Aye. Rory Stewart? No. Craig Tracy? No. The ayes were six and the noes nine, so the noes have it unlocked. Amendment 21 proposed to clause 6 as on the amendment paper. The question is that the amendment be made. As many as I have opinions say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. 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 I think the no's have it. Aye. Division. Division, number 11. Lock the doors. Take Brereton. No. Lambus, Cheryl Lambus. Aye. Robert Quartz. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria De Piero. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hansen. Aye. Peter Heaton Jones. No. Scott Mann. No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Onasanya. Aye. Ellie Reeves. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The ayes were six and the noes nine, so the noes have it unlocked. The question is that Clause 6 stand part of the bill. Aye. The question is that Clause 6 stand part of the bill. As many as no opinions say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 7 stand part of the bill. Aye. I have formally. Apologies, Henry. The question is that Clause 7 is now part of a bill. As many as no opinions say aye. 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 Contrary, no. 
I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. We now reach Amendment 17 to Clause 8. With this, it will be convenient to discuss Government New Clause 2 and New Clause 6. And with Government Amendments 5 and 6, I call Gloria De Piero to move the amendment. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Unlike the Government's over... I should first of all say this is an amendment uh, for insurers to report on whether savings have been passed on to consumers a new clause six requiring insurers to pass all savings as a result of changes to consumers. Unlike the government's overwordy, overcomplicated new clause two, which I will discuss shortly, Amendment 17 and our new clause six are straightforward. They would require the Financial Conduct Authority to insist that insurers report on the savings they have made as a result of this bill and the extent to which such savings have been passed on to policyholders. No caveats, no get-outs, just a straight-line requirement to do the right thing. The bill is the latest in a long line of government handouts to the insurance industry. Back in 2012, there was a closed-door meeting at number 10 when the insurers, in return for being able to set the fixed costs in the new fast track that the new Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act introduced, promised to reduce insurance premiums. Since then, the insurers have saved over £11 billion. Those are the ABI's figures, not mine. <coughs> Yet, as the Minister will have to concede, motor insurance premiums are <coughs> higher now than they were then. So much for those promises. In this bill, the Government have again swallowed the insurers' promises that they will reduce premiums, hook, line and sinker. History is repeating itself. The insurers are making record profits. Direct lines profits in 2017 jumped 52% to £570 million. And Aviva recorded a profit of 1.6 billion. No, that isn't all motor related, though in the case of direct line it will largely be so. Meanwhile, insurer CEOs are on multi million pound packages. Paul Geddes from Direct Line and Matt Wilson from Aviva both made over 4.3 million each in 2017. And now we have the measures we're discussing today, which will save the insurers 1.3 billion pounds a year. Of that, the insurers might, if the wind is blowing in the right direction, and none of the ludicrously large get-out clauses in the new clause to apply might hand across up to 80%. Notably, the cuts to insurance premiums of £35 a year, which insurers are promising now, are much lower than previous estimates of £50 per year promised with the Prison and Courts Bill. As a party that claims to oppose red tape, here is their chance to avoid it. Let's have a simple clause that does what it says on the tin, and that leads me to the Government's News Clause 4, which is as full of red tape as it is holes. Perhaps the most fundamental question I have to ask of the Minister about his new clause is, what is wrong with the word will? This amendment is peppered with the word may. If the Government is genuinely committed to ensuring that savings are passed on to consumers, why do they not insist that this happens? In sub-clause 3 of their new amendment, there is provision for all kinds of ways in which, by regulation, insurers should provide information. Is there any reason why that information should not be made publicly available? Sub-clause 4 of the Government's amendment is a catalogue of reasons why insurers could wheedle out of being transparent and evade passing on the very substantial savings the Government's impact assessment makes clear they will be making. The truth is that all the government has managed to extract from, from the insurers who stand to gain massively from this bill is a vague promise that they will pass on savings. Embarrassed by that lack of hard evidence of a commitment, the government puts forward this amendment, which is riddled with get-outs and opportunities for insurers to worm their way out of the flimsy commitments they have made. We know, and if the government is honest, they know, that insurers will seek to avoid paying the savings they make back to policyholders. This is what happened when they last made promises in 2012, and given the weakness of this amendment, that is what is going to happen again. The truth is that the government have rolled over, and the amendment is simply a fig leaf to cover their embarrassment. The answer I would suggest to the minister is for there to be a simple clause, which, and I use a phrase from his backbenchers, at second reading, will hold the insurer's feet to the fire. The clause we propose from this side says any savings made by any insurer as a result of anything in this Act or associated regulation will be passed to policyholders by way of reduced <coughs> premiums. What could be more simple? The Minister may notice that our proposed new clause quite deliberately refers to savings made as a result of changes by this regulation. 
The government has refused to allow the small, small claims changes that they propose onto the face of the bill. We come back to that later in our amendments. What is crucially different between the government's new clause 2 and our new clause 6 is not only that it is simpler, but our clause mentions the savings the insurers will make from the small claims changes. The government's impact assessment in calculating the $1.3 billion in savings the insurance will, insurers will make every year includes the savings created by the increase in the small claims limits as a result of the so-called wider package of measures. For the government to not include the savings made from the small claims limit changes within their new clause 2 renders it virtually worthless and undermines the government much vaunted and fundamental promise that motor insurance premiums will drop by £35 a year. Mr David Hanson. Uh, thank you, Sir Henry, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. Um, I know it's a long time ago, Sir Henry, but I want to take the committee back, if I may, to uh, the 25th of November 2015, when George Osborne, as he is now known, was the member for Tatton and was serving as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, at that time, the member for Tatton, as he was then, said in Hansard column 602, uh, he said, and I quote, we will bring forward reforms to the compensation culture around minor motor accident injuries and which will remove £1 billion from the cost of providing motor insurance. And this is the crucial bit, Sir Henry. We expect the industry to pass on this saving so that motorists see an average saving of £40 to £50 pounds per year off their insurance bills. That was in um, November 2015. Uh, when this bill was introduced into the House of Lords and subsequently into this place, the Ministry of Justice's impact assessment indicated at first that this figure would now be £40, not £50, not between £40 and £50, but £40. When the general election was fought, on which every honourable member opposite stood as a manifesto last year, that figure had miraculously gone from £40 to £35 at the time of the general election last year. And uh, in October of last year, one of the insurance companies of which the Minister has uh, been fond of quoting in another place, Lord Keane, which was Liverpool, Victoria, LV, Caroline Johnson, Director of Third Party and Technical Claims at LV, at the Motor Accident Society's annual conference in Sheffield, so it must be an important place to say this, it's not just off the cuff, it's said at the conference of motor society insurers, she said, and I quote, the £35 may or may not be achievable, may or may not be achievable. So my first question today in support of my honourable friend for Ashfield's clause, and uh, to start the testing of the Minister's new clause, is to say to the Minister, in his response, could he give the latest government assessment of what the £50 stroke £40 stroke £35 stroke possibly not achievable £35 is as of today because we're expected to um, take on trust the figures that the honourable gentleman has said because there's no doubt that the insurance company will save £1.3 billion a year uh, that figure has been accepted by the government it's been accepted by the insurance companies and I suspect it will be quoted again not just by my honourable friend for Ashfield but also by others to say that that's the saving and that's the prize that the government are trying to seek. Uh, my concern is not the insurance companies and the 1.3 billion. My concern is how much of that 1.3 billion, if there are savings to be made by the areas that we are concerned about, lands in the pockets of those individuals who have to have lower premiums as a result. Um, the Justice Committee, on which I am very pleased to sit, Indeed, I'm very pleased to sit coterminously this morning with this committee, uh, which was very interesting, I have to say, but there was a coterminous committee this morning. The Justice Committee did an investigation into this area and concluded, and this is the Justice Committee, Sir Henry, not the Labour members of the Justice Committee, the Justice Committee chaired by the Honourable Member for Beckenham, a Conservative, mm -hmm. and with a Conservative majority, and with unanimous support for the recommendations made on this very area said, and I quote, as obtaining insurance involves a commercial transaction with a private sector body, there is little the government can do to enforce lower premium rates without significant changes to present policies. So my question to the Minister is, um, with his new clause too, I can't find it, it may be hidden in there in legalese, but if it is hidden in there in legalese, could he put it in simplistic language for members of the committee today, 
What happens if this investigation proves the insurance companies have made a saving of anything between nothing and 1.3 billion? What steps will the government take at that stage to enforce their policy objective of uh, ensuring that uh, 50 pounds stroke, 40 pounds stroke, 35 pounds stroke, possibly 35 pounds goes into the pockets of individuals who are paying the insurance companies? Because government new clause two, Sir Henry, um, uh, God, half this committee may be dead by then, says uh, April the 1st, 2024, we'll make the assessment. April the 1st, 2024. Now that is uh, just under five and a half years' time from now. I hope we all uh, are here to see that, but it's five and a half years from now. The passing of a bill, I can't remember, I've been around the Goldfish Bowl a couple of times this year already on bill committees. I can't remember what I did last year on some committees because of the fact that we are busy people in this house. So who's going to hold the government to account on April the 1st, 2024, on the report that's produced by the Financial Conduct Authority, um, put into effect by the government's new clause too? And that's why I want the government today to say, not just that they will publish that report, but they will put that report for debate in the House, whoever is in the House on April the 1st, 2024, that they will also agree some mechanism, and the Minister could outline that now because he's got six years to find it, how to work it. He's got six years before this report comes out. If he can outline to the committee today what mechanism he's going to put in place to force the insurance companies to give back any premiums that they may be making as a result of these savings. Because I don't want to turn up at some future parliament, and we're not talking about the parliament after next, in 2024, when an insurance company is going to come along and say to the Financial Conduct Authority, if everything in New Clause 2 goes hunky-dory, they're going to come along and say, we've made £300 million, we've made £500 million, we've saved £1.3 billion. And then, what is the government going to do? What is the government going to say when that figure comes out? I can't find it. It might be in here, hidden away, but I'd like the Minister to tell me what the government is going to do if a figure of surplus, as a result of these savings, is made and it hasn't been returned to insurance companies. I'd like to know what rigour the government's going to put in place with the Financial Conduct Authority to ensure that it is rigorously examining the costs and services. Because I'm pretty sure that if I was a pretty smart insurance company, that I would find a way to find yeah. some costs that would be put onto yeah. my costs to show that actually, although I may have saved 1.3 billion on this, I've actually had different challenges. There's been renewed claims, there's been this, there's been that. I'm not involved in the insurance industry. I could probably, if I spent the next week thinking about it, find 10 reasons why my costs have increased and that 1.3 billion has been subsumed. So I think the Minister has a duty to talk to the House today and tell the House on new clause two what it is he expects the Financial Conduct Authority to do. Because the whole premise, Sir Henry, of this uh, proposal by the government has been that this is going to stop uh, insurance companies having extra costs and those extra costs are going to be passed on to you and I and everybody else who has a car in saved premiums. Well, the government's figure itself, as I started my contribution with, has gone from £50 in November 2015 to £35 now, with the insurance companies themselves saying £35 may or may not be achievable. Well, may or may not, Sir Henry, is quite a loose term. May or may not means that we don't yet know what the figure is. And I'd like to know from the Minister, not just when we're going to find out on April the 1st, 2024, but whenever this legislation is enacted, there's going to be a period of time between now and April the 1st, 2024. And my honourable friend for Ashfield's uh, proposal says that we should look at the figures earlier than that period of time. Because I'd like to know what the insurance companies are saving in 2019 or 2020 or 2021 or 2022 or 2023, or indeed in 2024. Will you, uh, give, will you give way? Is, is it not the case that... For an assessment to be made, the best assessment would be the first year in which the changes are enacted, not years down the line. Well, I think uh, my old friend makes a very valid point. It's one I hadn't thought of, and I'm grateful to him for bringing that to the attention of the committee. It would be sensible to see if, if this saving is going to be made, is it made early on? Because downstream, as my old friend has indicated, there will be a tapering, no doubt. So I think the Minister has a duty, if he's going to propose new clause two, which, to be frank, Sir Henry, if I can be honest with the committee, 
He's only doing because he got done over in another place by members of the House of Lords and couldn't get it through the House of Lords without this new clause. And he got done over in another place because the Justice Committee unanimously said that there should be, um, uh, and I quote, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority to monitor the extent which any premium reductions can be attributed to these measures and report back to us after 12 months. Now again, I go back, Sir Henry, to the All-Party Justice Committee, chaired by a Conservative MP, Conservative Majority. That said, in its report on this bill, that we should report back within 12 months. Um, helpfully reminded by my honourable friend uh, from Brighton as to the reasons why we suggested that at that time, because we wanted to see what the impact is within 12 months. Now, again, um, uh, in the amendment that was tabled by the noble Lord, Lord Sharkey, in the House of Lords, Lord Keane, uh, who was the minister dealing with this in another place, said during the report stage, the government are not unsympathetic to the underlying intention of Amendment 46 as tabled by the noble Lord Sharkey. The point is that having made a firm commitment, insurers should be accountable for meeting it. That was what his colleague minister said in the House of Lords, and I don't disagree with that. I just say to the minister that April 2024 seems a tad uh, uh, in the future to secure the proposals that he's indicating to the committee today. So I think um, in his contribution, the minister needs to indicate very firmly to the committee what he anticipates the savings to be now, how he's going to monitor, not just now, but in the next five years, what the insurance companies are making and how he's going to hold the insurance companies to account to ensure that whatever they end up in, be it April the 1st, 2024, or be it, as I would hope if my honourable friend's amendment was passed an earlier date, how he's going to make sure that the insurance companies meet their obligations and give the money back to the people who actually are funding it in the first place. Um, it's a great honour to serve under your chairmanship, uh, Sir Henry, and uh, very grateful to honourable and right honourable members for bringing forward these amendments and new clauses. Um, effectively, as the honourable member for Dellen has pointed out, a new clause two is already a, a clause introduced uh, with a lot of influence from the House of Lords, driven by opposition members of the House of Lords, to meet exactly the concerns that have been raised by honourable and right honourable members, and therefore I will be attempting to argue in my brief argument that uh, Amendment 17 and New Clause 6 are in fact unnecessary. The uh, Noble Lords did a very good job in New Clause 2 in addressing many of the concerns that have been raised in this debate, and that's why the government is keen to ask for your support to them. Um, fundamentally though, Sir Henry, at the heart of this, uh, you will discover that this is fundamentally a disagreement about the nature of markets. And this is going to be a difficult thing to resolve simply through legislation. There are profoundly different views on both sides of the House about what exactly is going on in a market. Again and again, all the arguments from the member for Jarrow right the way through to the eloquent speech of the member for Dellen rest on the fundamental assumption that every company in the country, insurance company or otherwise, is simply involved in trying to charge their consumers as much as possible and provide as few services as possible, and that there is nothing to prevent them doing this. Now, of course, the thing that prevents them doing this ought to be competition. And this doesn't matter whether it's the insurance industry or, to take a more straightforward question, uh, the question of why Tesco's doesn't charge 50 pounds for a loaf of bread and try to produce one slice. In the end, what is going to drive the decision on what kind of premiums are charged is going to be driven by competition between different insurance companies. And all the arguments, I'm going to give away to the Honourable Member down in a second, regardless of whether it's in relation to these amendments or other amendments, is faced on this fundamental misunderstanding. The Labour Party is again effectively pushing for a price and incomes policy. They're trying to get the government to fix the prices of premiums and control the prices that insurance companies charge because they simply do not trust the Competition and Markets Authority or the FCA or the insurance industry or any other business to pass on savings to consumers. I give way. David Hanson. With respect to the Minister, what the Labour Party, if I may say so, is asking for in this case is just confirmation of what the government have said it wanted to do. Yeah. The government have said it wants to save £1.3 billion and the government said in November 15 it was going to give £50 back as premiums. That figure has changed. 
All we're asking today, or I'm asking today, is what is the figure today? What's the government's estimate of the figure today? And the Minister should be able to give an estimate because he's given one on two previous occasions in a, uh, an assessment of the financial implications of the bill, in a Conservative Party manifesto, and in a Chancellor's statement to the House of Commons. Minister. Um, so, Sir Henry, unfortunately, something is being missed here in the way in which the Honourable Member for Denham is framing these arguments. He's suggesting that there is a fixed stable situation where £50 was offered by the Chancellor's Exchequer, nothing's changed, and now it's £35. If that were true, it would indeed be a disgrace. But the reality is that through all the negotiations that have taken place in the consultation and in the House of Lords, the number of savings which the insurance companies will realise and be in a position to pass on to the uh, man paying the premium or woman paying the premium is considerably reduced. It's considerably reduced because when the Lord Chancellor, when the Chancellor's Exchequer is set up, Honourable Member Fidela might be interested in the answer uh, rather than talking to somebody else. I, when, the, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer spoke, he of course suggested that all general damages would be entirely removed. The proposal of the Chancellor's Exchequer was that there would be no general damages at all. It is therefore perfectly reasonable that if no general damages at all were paid, the insurance company's savings would be considerably larger, and the savings passed on to the consumer might indeed have been £50. Due to the very good work that the opposition's put in and the noble lords have put in, this bill has had a number of compromises, which will mean that the savings passed on to the insurers and from the insurers in the form of premium will be considerably reduced. And one of those is that whereas in the past there were going to be no general damages paid to anybody getting a whiplash injury of under two years, there's now a tariff where money will be paid out. And as you get closer to two years, the tariffs paid out will be much closer to the existing Judicial College guidelines, so the savings will be considerably less. Yeah. Uh, 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 we've been here before with the uh, energy price cap bill. In that bill, the government is now an act. The government actually fixed the amounts. Uh, they capped the energy price cap, and they said that the uh, the big energy companies would be giving money back to the consumers. And even though the money isn't as high as we expected it to be, that then it was 100 pounds. That's around 70. Um, why doesn't the minister want to do that with insurance companies? So th this is a very good question, and the Honourable Member for Enfield Southgate and the Honourable Member for Denon are essentially asking the same question, as indeed this whole debate is. The question is the extent to which the government wishes to interfere in the market in order to fix prices. As the Honourable Member for Enfield Southgate has suggested, that in the case of the energy companies, a very, very unusual, unprecedented decision was made to follow actually a suggestion originally made by the Labour Party that we should get involved in fixing prices. This is something that, generally speaking, from a policy point of view, and here we disagree with the party opposite, this is a deep ideological division that goes back nearly 100 years between our two parties. We are a party that fundamentally trusts the market. Now, in the case of the insurance companies, we have here the words of the Financial Conduct Authority and the Competition Market Authority to argue that the insurance companies are, in fact, operating in a highly competitive environment. The reason we did not initially suggest that we needed to introduce anything equivalent to the new clause that the government's now introducing as new clause two is precisely because we believe the market is already operating well and that savings passed on to the insurance companies will be passed on to the consumers in the same way as operates in any other aspect of the market. And I haven't yet had a very strong argument from the other side on why they believe this not to be the case. I can only conclude. I can only conclude that the Honourable Members opposite, logically I assume, can only be making one argument. They must be somehow implying that the insurance companies are operating in an illegal cartel. But I give way Jersey. to hear why they believe this isn't the case. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. And um, he's referred to this side of the committee with wanting to fix the market, fix prices. But he also just mentioned trust. And that is exactly what this is about, because we've been through this situation before. Previously, insurers promised to return savings to consumers, and they didn't. So why is it different this time? Why does the minister think that we can trust insurers um, on their word this time when they've not done it previously? Minister. So uh, the recent evidence on the cost of motor premiums shows that after the implementation of the last set of reforms, 
there was a flattening off in the increase in insurance premiums, which was lower than inflation. Now, the reason why we believe this mechanism works, and this was all part of the evidence that Henry put forward by the Competition Markets Authority, is because it is a very mobile market. So currently at the moment, 72% of policyholders have switched their motor insurance providers. It's not a market which is static, where people don't move between providers. This provides a very, very strong incentive to compete on the premiums. Again, 50% currently of insurance uh, customers are currently going to comparison websites to compare the premium prices. All of this is part of the reasons why we believe insurance will pass on the savings consumers. But we concede that there is clearly an issue of public trust. There's an issue of trust from the opposition. There's an issue of trust which is expressed in the House of Lords, which is why we believe we've come forward with the correct new clause two, which will allow members and honorable members on right honorable members on every side of the House to actually hold the insurers to account. In a very, very detailed amendment put forward by the government, uh, and which uh, the right honorable opposite uh, suggested was too detailed, we have specified all the information we expect the insurers to provide so that we are in a position to really work out exactly what savings they derived from this and allow the Treasury, working with the Financial Conduct Authority, to come to a view on whether or not they're passing on the savings to customers. Now, the Honourable Member for Denon then asked the question, what is the point of this and why don't we say in it that there's some compulsory mechanism to pass it on? The answer is that all of this depends on competition and market law. If we end up in a situation where, at the end of the reporting period, there is clear evidence that the companies have significantly increased their revenues without passing on savings to customers, that will raise very considerable questions about the operation of the markets and competitions, and it may indeed imply as right honorable, and honorable members opposite seem to be implying, that there is some form of illegal cartel in operation. At the moment, there is no evidence that that's happening. Yep. Does he accept that since the changes made in 2012, insurance companies have saved £11 billion? Minister. Um, I'm not in a position to accept or reject that figure. I'm not familiar with that figure, and I'm not clear how that figure's arrived at. So I'm very happy to look at that in more detail before report stage of the bill. Yeah, yeah. um, just to uh, thank the Minister for giving the wit, and just to, uh, to put on record that you mentioned the LAPSO reforms. But isn't it right that in the two years following the LAPSO reforms, uh, insurers actually passed on £1.1 billion pounds worth of saving and saw average premiums drop by £50? Pounds? Minister? Um, again, here, the Competition Markets Authority is our best guide on this. Their job is to look very closely at the operations of their industry. They believe this is a very competitive industry, which is why, Sir Henry, they are confident both that the reforms introduced previously led to savings that were passed on to customers and why they believe the current reforms will also lead to the same. If this is not happening, it would be very interesting to hear from the Labour Party what their theory is as to why competition is not operating in this market and why they believe there is a cartel. But if that's the argument they wish to make, they will be assisted, not impeded, by the government new clause which will enable them to gather the information with the Treasury and the Financial Conduct Authority in order to make precisely this case. Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. Perhaps I can help him on that um, figure that my honourable friend uh, mentioned to him of £11 billion pounds savings um, after the 2012 changes. That is actually an ABI figure. And they have saved that figure in claims costs over, the, over six years, according to their own evidence, and premiums are now mm -hmm. higher than ever, again, according to their own evidence. To return uh, to the fundamental disagreement that's happening here between uh, honourable members and right honourable members, I think we can all agree that there were significant savings to the insurance industry that came. We can all agree that some of those savings were passed on to customers. 
we can all agree that the premiums cease to rise at the rate at which they were previously rising. There is some disagreement between two sides of the House about whether they passed on enough savings or whether, as we're arguing, they passed on sufficient savings, whether the premiums went up more than they should have done or they should not have done. But unless we can get the government new clause through, there will not be the evidence or the information available to people in order to make these kinds of arguments. In order to make this argument, it's not enough to produce a general figure saying, here is 11 billion pounds and this is how much was passed on in premiums, which is why we have no less than 11 sub-clauses detailing the kind of data that you would need to extract from the insurance industry by the date recommended in order to prove that case. Now, the question was, why would they not report annually? The answer to that, of course, is that a claim can be brought any time within three years of the rate of the accident. So this date takes into account the fact that the law is likely to come into or is due to come into effect in 2020. We add three years to that for the claim, and then we add the time to do the data gathering and evidence in order to report in 2024. Well, just on that, on the the Minister has given, if the bill comes into effect in 2020 and he adds three years to that, that's 2023. This, on new clause two, uh, part 7 says before the end of the period of one year beginning with the 1st of April 2024. That means the report may not even be done until the end of April, March 2025. Mm -hmm. Then will be published by the government possibly, you know, after that. And then there'll be some discussion, then there'll be further discussion. So we're talking even on his timetable of three years past the deadline that he's indicated of uh, 2023 just to this committee a moment ago. He should reflect on this and bring back an amendment to his new clause that report which brings forward this proposal quite considerably. Minister? Um, so the reason why I would respectfully uh, request that the government uh, amendment is supported and the opposition amendments are withdrawn is that pushing for one year rather than three year uh, reviews and attempting to price fix the result would leave these amendments by the opposition open to judicial review and also create an enormous burden on the market itself and an unnecessary burden on the market. Our contention is that this market already operates and we have the Competition Market Authority to argue that that is the case. By introducing our new clause, we will be able to demonstrate that over time, and it is a very serious thing. I remain very confident that if the insurance companies are compelled to produce this degree of detail and information, they will pass on those savings to consumers, because were they not to, having produced this amount of information to the Financial Conduct Authority and the Treasury, they would be taking a very, very considerable legal risk. So this is something that they themselves uh, initially resisted and they themselves understand is a very serious yeah. obligation. Ruth George. Thank you very much. As <coughs> the Minister has said, then the insurance companies have uh, said that they will be passing on savings to consumers and the government has been actively engaged in trying to ensure that all insurance companies sign up to a pledge to reduce premiums. Uh, so that in itself is a way of fixing the market as well. But can I ask if it's going to take insurance companies seven years from now in which to produce the information, from what date will premiums actually be reduced? When can consumers see an actual payback from this policy? Well, we would expect, because of the nature of competition, for the premiums to begin to reduce soon, almost immediately. In fact, premiums dropped from £442 in 2012 to £388 in 2015, and that legislation came in in 2012. So the drop we would expect to come in quite quickly as the insurance companies anticipate the nature of these changes and move to compete with each other to drop premiums and attract new customers. On the in which case, if you expect premiums to drop so soon, why can't the government report to the House on those premiums dropping? Um, well, the premiums dropping uh, will be assessed and published in the normal fashion. The requirement in the new clause is much more complex than that. The, the requirement in the new clause requires a prodigious amount of information about all forms of income streams, number of claims, number of premium holders in order to 
develop a very sophisticated and detailed picture for the Treasury and the Financial Conduct Authority in order to be able to accurately address exactly the concerns that right honourable members opposite are holding, which is that over that period, particularly the three-year period that will be affected by the introduction of this new uh, law, uh, that the insurance companies will not be passing on savings to consumers. We believe that they will, which is why we have been very comfortable pushing for this unprecedented step to gather that information in order to demonstrate that the market, in fact, works. And on that, Sir Henry, I would very politely request that the opposition withdraw their amendments and that we support the government amendment, which was, after all, brought together by opposition members of the House of Lords and others, and which achieves exactly the objectives that the opposition has set out today. Yeah. Gloria de Piero. Uh, the Minister talked a lot about where there is disagreement uh, across the committee. But there are areas that we can all accept as facts. The fact that insurance profits are up massively. The fact that these changes will save insurance companies £1.3 billion. And we can all agree that we want premiums to come down. We think that only Amendment 17 and new Clause 6 will deliver that. And we reject that new Clause 2 will deliver that. So we like divisions. Please. Amendment 17 proposed to clause 8 as on the amendment paper. The question is that the amendment be made. As many as I open in say aye. 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 Uh, to the contrary, no? No. no. I think the aye. no. Aye. Division. Division. You happy to have the doors locked? Happy to have the doors locked. Lock the doors. Jack Brereton? No. Bambus Sharanambus? Aye. Robert Courts? No. Chris Davis? No. Gloria De Piero? Aye. Ruth George? Aye. Chris Green? No. David Hansen? Aye. Peter Heaton Jones? No. Scott Mann? No. Amanda Milling? No. Fiona Anasanya? Aye. Ellie Reeves? Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle? Aye. Joe Stevens? Aye. Rory Stewart? No. Craig Tracy? No. Eyes eight, nose nine. So the nose have it, uh, the nose have it. Uh, unlock. Pressures of clause eight sound part of a bill. Formally. The motion is that clause 8 stand part of the bill. As many as opinions say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 9 stand part of the bill. Formally. The question is that clause 9 stand part of the bill. As many as opinions say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now reach Amendment 24 to Clause 10. The Bishop will be convened to discuss Amendments 22 and 23. New Clause 5 and Clause Stand Park. I will now call, call Ellie Reeves to move the amendment. Thank you, Sir Henry. I beg to move Amendment 24 and New Clark Clause 5 in my name and those of my normal friends, 22 and 23. <laughs> As well. The personal injury discount rate is a pivotal part of the compensation process. It must be carefully treated in how it is reviewed, calculated and set. The rate is so critically important as it helps determine what an injured person receives following what can often be life-changing injuries. Damages are paid to individuals to account for the losses caused by an injury. Usually a lump sum compensation award, the level at which the personal injury discount rate is set is based upon assumptions about the level of risk of the recipient's investment of their awarded damages. This helps to ensure that any future market fluctuations are accounted for. The rate ensures that recipients ultimately receive the level of compensation that was intended and that we do not enter into a state of extreme over or under compensation. The need for the rate to be correct is, uh, correct, set correctly is clear. An individual who is involved in a major car crash 
who breaks their uh, back and may never work again as a result, may need to adapt to their home, they may need to pay for care, they will have loss of earnings. Uh, when they receive uh, their compensation uh, as a lump sum, they would need to invest it. And at present, injured individuals are treated as very risk-averse investors, rightly so given the impact a major injury will likely have on one's perception of risk and also the fact that these are not uh, investors uh, going about the, the, the stocking market, stock market. These are people whose uh, future um, uh, quality of life depends on uh, making sure they've got enough uh, money uh, to live on and to provide uh, important care. So it's imperative that uh, the rate uh, is set at correct levels to ensure that compensation awards are delivered as intended uh, based on the risk of the investments uh, that uh, the sums are entered into. Amendment 24 would replace existing Schedule A1 with a far more appropriate means of setting the discount rate, allowing it to be set by an expert pa panel rather than politicising the decision by the Lord Chancellor. Amendments 22 and 23 would ensure that the expert panel would be setting the rate right from the very beginning and not just in subsequent reviews. Throughout this bill, there are too many incidences of handing power from experts to ministers without sufficient checks and balances. This is not right, and the concessions offered by the government for ministers to liaise with some experts do not go far enough. Our amendment would shift the emphasis from the Lord Chancellor to the independent expert panel. Further, the Justice Select Committee recommended in their pre-legislative scrutiny report into the draft personal injury discount rate that the panel should advise on the first review and that if the Lord Chancellor chooses not to follow the panel's advice when setting the, the rate, that information should be made public along with his or her reasons for so doing. Unfortunately, the requirement to consult a panel whilst appearing in the bill initially was removed during the House of Lords stages. Opposition amendments seek to address this and would add much needed clarity and transparency into how the RET is set both initially and going forward and would avoid politically or ideologically driven decisions by shifting the balance to experts. Section 5 of Amendment 24 to Schedule 1A clearly outlines the necessary credentials of members of the expert panel, whether they be experienced actuaries, investment managers or economists. Transparency and independence and external expertise are vital in setting the rate and should surely be welcomed. To hand over decision-making to the Lord Chancellor, as many sections of the bill currently do, would be to remove the independence from a process which helps deliver access to justice. Confidence in politicians is uh, at a low and we cannot have confidence in our justice systems and the faith of our constituents in their ability to access justice fall to equally low levels. New Clause 5 would also see the expert panel conduct a review of the assumptions on which the rate is set within three years of the legislation coming into force. This is set to be within three years of the date of the schedule coming into force, and although the existing Schedule A1 and Amendment 24 maintain the period of review of the rate as within five years, as amended in the House of Lords, I hope the Minister can give assurances that should it be found during the review of the assumptions that the most prevalent investment, investments by injured claimants are determined to be very low risk, and as such are not receiving appropriate compensation, that the uh, rate will be uh, changed uh, sooner rather than later within that period. It is imperative that the vast changes this bill introduces has the sufficient checks and balances in place to ensure the changes are working as intended and not leaving injured claimants suffering further in the pursuit of justice. As I outlined in my speech at second reading, the changes this bill introduces have the potential to be a textbook example of a change in the law with ramifications that we will not truly know until much further down the line, at which point it will be too late, the damage done and access to justice eviscerated for many. For this reason, it is important that we ensure the correct checks and balances, regular reviews and expert-led rate setting are formed as part of the bill. I hope by implementing these, we won't see a repeat of the access to justice crisis caused by LASBO, employment tribunal fees and the anticipated impact of changes to the small claims limit. The Government should take time to implement these amendments to Part 2 of the Bill and I move the amendments and new clause bill. Right. Amendment 24 proposes clause 10 as on the amendment paper. The question is, is the amendment be made? Bambos, uh, Sharon Ambos. Thank you. Um, Let's be clear about what we're talking about with the discounted rate. This is damages for people that have suffered catastrophic, life-changing injuries. 
and the lump sum that they receive is there to last them for their entire lives. And it's not there to, um, as, it's there to pay for urgent treatments, care, support, adaptations, for a whole host of things. So we need to be very, very careful about how we deal with this because very small variations in the discounted rate can have serious uh, impact. Um, to give an example, um, I've been advised by uh, a leading law firm that they settled a claim in 2015 for a client in her 30s who suffered cardiac arrest and irreparable brain damage due to, due to negligence uh, and was awarded a 9.9 uh, five million pounds when the discounted rate was 2.5 percent. Now this award was to pay for extensive medical treatment, childcare and for living carers for the rest of her life. Had the claim been settled in 2017 when the discount rate was changed to minus 0.75 percent, it would have resulted in a settlement of 20 million. Now these cases are relatively few in number but when they do occur we must make sure that they are dealt with as precisely as possible without leaving such large fluctuations to chance. And I think we'll all agree that the, the time between the two uh, variable rates, uh, this kind of rates that were set, uh, was far too long. And uh, I very much support a smaller period of time for that to take place. So looking at um, somebody who receives this lump sum, um, surely they will choose to invest it in as low risk as possible. They want to have any risk if, if uh, possible, but they wouldn't, they, they want to make sure it was at a very, very low risk because this, as I said earlier, is to last them for their entire lives. So the discounted rate should be set on the basis that the investment will be at a very, very low risk. Now, in setting the rate, the Lord Chancellor uh, is given a wide ranging discretion in setting the discounted rate. Now, this opens up the potential for uh, other factors to come in to influence the Lord Chancellor uh, in setting that rate. And as I mentioned earlier, these factors could adversely impact the, uh, the compensation that's received by somebody that's suffered these uh, catastrophic injuries. So I think we need to be quite clear that the reasons why the Lord Chancellor will be making, will be setting the rate. And as my um, honourable friend, the member for Lewisham Western Penge has already mentioned, the Justice Committee setting, recommended setting up an independent panel of experts to advise the Lord Chancellor in setting up the rate uh, and that the panel's advice should be published in full. Now one of the things that the bill has done is taken away that transparency uh, and because of that um, I have grave concerns about the, why that's been done and how the rate will be set. We will need to know how the rates will be set. In the same way as uh, we have the Bank of Indian when they set their interest rates, they have their panel of experts who set the interest rates and they give reasons why they've set the interest rate. Uh, I think a similar thing should apply there. Uh, but I think uh, in supporting the, um, the amendment and the new clause, um, I think it would be right and proper for this to be taken away from the Lord Chancellor and for it to be set by the independent panel of experts and to be done on a regular basis. Well, thank you, Sir Henry. I have an enormous amount of sympathy for these clauses that have been brought forward, uh, and in particular, the arguments around the amendments 24, 22, and 23. Um, as the Honourable Member for Lewisham Western Penge, and indeed uh, the Honourable uh, Member who just spoke, have clarified, we are dealing here with people who have suffered catastrophic, uh, life-changing injuries, and we have a very particular responsibility, particularly since some of these people can be immensely vulnerable. They could include children who've been through catastrophic life-changing injuries, and therefore we all have an obligation on every side of the House to ensure that the principle of 100% compensation is met. The discount rate can seem a slightly technical, a mathematical formula, so obviously the discount rate is there to try to hedge effectively against inflation and expected rate of investment return in setting an award. And uh, as the Honourable Member just pointed out, a shift in the discount rate could mean a difference between an award of £10 million and an award of £20 million, a very, very significant difference. In setting the discount rate, therefore, our first obligation has to be towards the very vulnerable individuals who suffered a catastrophic or life-changing injury. And we need to make sure that they are able to make an investment 
which is a investment that does not carry substantial risk so that we can, insofar as it's possible, we can't guarantee everything because inflation can move, markets can move, but insofar as we can, in advance, attempt to arrive at a rate which fairly reflects the likelihood of them getting the compensation which they were anticipated to get from the judge. And that means also that we should not be aiming to chase a median rate. We should be aiming to chase a rate on the basis of the advice from the government actuary and later from the expert panel to determine what the fair rate of return is. So why uh, is the government in that case challenging Amendments 24, 22 and 23? Well, the answer, of course, is that Amendments 22 and 23 uh, reflect the original position of the government on its bill. So we're slightly going around in circles here. We had originally suggested uh, in the version of the bill that we presented to the House of Lords that the Lord Chancellor should consult with the expert panel before setting the rate. It was under pressure from opposition members of the House of Lords, in particular Lord Sharkey, that the Lords pushed us into a position where we agreed that instead of there being an expert panel, it should be the government actuary working with the Lord Chancellor to set the first rate. The argument made by the Lib Dem peer and backed by others, including Lord Beecham, was that the problems for the NHS currently caused by the discount rate are so extreme and the costs on the public purse are so extreme, they wanted the first change in the discount rate to happen relatively rapidly with the advice of the government actuary. Were we now to reject that amendment, which we accepted after long negotiation in the House of Lords, we would now have to go back to the drawing board, set up the expert panel again, and lead to a very significant delay, which would impose costs on the NHS. So we are in the ironic position that the opposition is now proposing, uh, as amendments, the original government position, which the amendments, the opposition struck down in the House of Lords. So we are slightly in danger going around circles. We are where we are. And given the problems of time, I would suggest that the pragmatic compromise is the government actuary, who is an independent individual with enormous expertise in this, works with the Lord Chancellor on the first setting of the rate and subsequent settings of the rate. The expert panel comes in as the House of Lords recommended. Now, that then brings us to Amendment 24, a very lengthy amendment, uh, which the Honourable Member for Lewis and Weston Penge brought forward uh, with great eloquence. That essentially argues that the rate should be set by the expert panel alone and not by the Lord Chancellor. Why is it that we uh, disagree with this? We disagree fundamentally because the expert panel and the government actuary would argue, I suggest, that it is not their position to be setting the rate. It is their position to provide actuarial advice on the different investment decisions that could be made the likely rates of inflation and the likely rates of return. But ultimately, it needs to be an accountable minister, accountable parliament, who sets that rate, because that person has to balance some very different issues. Our obligation towards vulnerable people who suffer catastrophic life-changing injuries, and our obligations ultimately towards the costs in the National Health Service, which are running into billions of pounds, and balancing these different public goods. It simply would not be fair to expect an actuary to make those kinds of political and social decisions. It's entirely appropriate to expect actuarial experts to provide the expert advice on what the range of options would be and to reassure individuals that the Lord Chancellor is not likely to be making a decision uh, which would have a significant negative impact. You only have to look at what the Lord Chancellor two ago did in setting the rates of minus 0.75%. If it had been the case that the Lord Chancellor was fundamentally driven by Treasury calculations and was not interested in defending the vulnerable individual, they would not have moved the rate from 2.5% to minus 0.75%, effectively doubling the compensation paid. The Lord Chancellor, in setting this rate, on the advice of the expert panel, will be acting as the Lord Chancellor, not as the Secretary of State for Justice. There was a, a big change when the last Lord Chancellor set the rate at point, uh, minus 0.75%. Uh, I just wonder what advice she received and who from in setting that rate, because clearly she would have got some advice uh, rather than getting that figure out there. So I just wonder what the situation is now. So uh, at the moment, uh, the advice that would have been received uh, would be from actuaries, and ultimately we commissioned the government actuary department voluntarily to provide their best advice on what the rate should be. They then arrived at a guilt rate, which drove us towards the minus 0.75%. What this legislation does 
is put the role of the government actuary into law, so it's no longer voluntary but compulsory, it's obligatory on the Lord Chancellor to consult, and in future a broader expert panel around the government actuary. Finally, Sir Henry, the government will publish the report of the government actuary and will publish the report in later reviews of the panel, and I'm happy to make that commitment to the Honourable Member for Anfield Southgate uh, because of his question on transparency. And on that, I respectfully ask the amendments are withdrawn and that the government amendment is instead accepted. Gloria De Piero. Thank you, Sir Henry. Um, my uh, learned and experienced uh, colleagues have um, spoken in great detail about the issues that we have with these amendments, so I don't um, anticipate giving too uh, long a speech. Just to say that uh, I wholeheartedly concur with the comments made by my honourable friend on the importance of periodical payment orders and a proper and timely review of the personal injury discount rate. As everybody who has spoken has said, we are talking here of the most seriously injured. They cannot and must not be let down by playing politics or by insurers seeking to save money. On the front bench amendments relevant to this clause, amendments 22 and 23, we say that if an expert panel is appropriate for subsequent reviews, then why shouldn't expert opinion from this panel be appropriate for the initial determination of the rate of the return? And that's why we will move to a division to Henry. I thank the Minister for uh, his um, response uh, to uh, the points that I raised, but for the reasons that I have set out and uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Enfield Southgate has uh, made, uh, I, I would want to move um, uh, Amendment uh, 24 and new Clause 5 for division. Amendment 24 proposed to Clause 10 as on the amended paper. The, amend the question is that the amendment be made. As many as I have been in say aye. 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 The contrary, no. 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 I think the no. No. division. <coughs> you have over doors? You have over doors? Yes. Yeah. Lock for doors? Clark Brereton? No. Lambus Terranambus? Aye. Robert Courts? Chris Davis? No. Gloria Di Piero? Aye. Ruth George? Aye. Chris Green? No. David Hanson? Aye. Peter Heaton Jones? No. Scott Mann? No. Amanda Milling? No. Fiona Onasanya? Aye. Ellie Reeves? Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle? Aye. Joe Stevens? Aye. Rory Stewart? No. Craig Tracy? No. The eyes were eight, the nose were nine, so the nose have it, the nose have it, unlock. Amendment 22 proposed to clause 10 as on the amendment paper. The question is that the amendment be made. As many of the opinions say aye. To the contrary, no. No! no. no. I think the nose have it, the nose have it. We've debated Clause 10 part along with a previous group of amendments. The question is that Clause 10 stand part of the bill. As many of the opinions say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. 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 I think the ayes no. have it. No. Division. Division number 11. You have Lock the doors. Jack Brereton. Aye. Lambus Sharon Lambus. No. Robert Courts. Aye. Chris Davis. Aye. Gloria Di Piero. No. Ruth George. No. Chris Green. Aye. David Hanson. No. Peter Heaton Jones. Uh, excuse me. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Was that an eye? Yes. <laughs> aye. <laughs> Scott Mann. Aye. Amanda Milling. Aye. The owner on the No. Eddie Reeves. No. <coughs> Lloyd Russell Moyle. No. Joe Stevens. No. Rory Stewart. Aye. Craig Tracy. Aye.
The ayes were nine and the noes ten, so the ayes have it. The, the noes ten, I beg your pardon. Eight. <coughs> Eight. So the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Unlock. We now come to the new clauses table for the bill. We have already debated Government New Clause 2 during our debates on Clause 8. I ask Minister to move that formally. Formally. Report on effects of Parts 1 and 2. The question is that the clause be read a second time and be added to the bill. As many of you men say, aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. The next is new clause 1. Gloria De Piero. Thank you, Sir Henry. Our new clause 1 deals with one of the most important effects of this package of measures. It says that the whiplash small claims limit can only increase in line with inflation based on CPI. It also specifies that the limit can increase only when inflation has increased the existing rate by £500 since it was last set. The government has been very disingenuous in trying to sneak through these changes to the small claims track limit by using delegated legislation, restricting the proper scrutiny that such significant changes deserve. With this new clause, we ask them to do the right thing and put them on the face of this bill, enshrining the particular terms that a plethora of experts agree on, the use of CPI over RPI when it comes to inflation, and using 1999 as a starting date for any recalculation of the limit for the small claims track. The white book, which I showed him earlier, shows that there was an effective 20% increase in the small claims limit in 1999 when special damages were removed from the calculation of the limit. Lord Justice Jackson, in his review of civil litigation costs, final report said, and I quote, that the only reason to increase the personal injury small claims limit would be to reflect inflation since 1999. A series of small rises in the limit would be confusing for practitioners and judges alike. He made it crystal clear that the limit should remain at £1,000 until inflation warrants an increase to £1,500. The government admitted to me this morning that there is a difference of opinion in their own ranks about which of these years sh should be the benchmark. We say to them again this afternoon that they must listen to Lord Justice Jackson and the Justice Committee chaired by one of their own who agrees with him. We should state on the face of this bill that 1999 must be the starting date for any recalculation of the small claims limit, not 1991. The government accepted all the key recommendations in the Jackson report, save the recommendation that there should only be an increase in the small claims limit to £1,500 when inflation justifies it. Turning to another aspect of this subject, which the government has admitted today has caused a dispute amongst ministers, I want to make the case, as I have done before, that CPI is the correct measure to apply when it comes to inflation, not RPI. It seems that the government uses RPI when it suits and CPI when it suits. CPI is what we use for the pensions and benefits paid to injured workers while they are pursuing justice for their injury through a claim. The Chief Secretary to the Treasurer even agrees with me. When asked if she agreed that RPI was an inadequate measure of the House of Laws Economic Affairs Committee, she said, I quote, we certainly agree that it is not the preferred measure of inflation. CPI is a much better measure of inflation. We agree that it is not the preferred method and we are seeking to move away from the RPI, the words of the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So why are we moving towards it here? They, wish, they say they wish to apply RPI to the small claims limit because RPI is applied to updating damages. These are the same damages that they are taking in act with, with the new tariffs. Perhaps some in their own party are persuaded, like me, that CPI is the best option because of yet another expert who has lined up to say so. The Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, who said, 30th January 2018, at the moment we have RPI, which most would, would acknowledge has known errors. We have CPI, which is what virtually everyone recognises and is in our remit. It is perfectly clear what we need to do, enshrine CPI as the key measure on the face of the bill today. £1,000 from 1999 would now be worth either £1,440 applying CPI, or 1,620 applying RPI. As Lord Jackson said, you should not go up to £2,000, as the government suggests, until inflation warrants it. I trust that the Minister won't be as dismissive of the sums we are taking, talking about as Lord Keane was when he said his evidence to the Justice Committee. We do not feel that there is a material difference between setting it 
at 1700 today and seeing it drop behind inflation next year and setting it at 2000 without the need to review it again for a number of years. Try telling the nurse, the caretaker, the bus driver that there is no material difference between 1700 and 2000. For those on real wages, this has a real impact. Restriction on increase in small claims limits for relevant personal injuries. The question is that the clause be read a second time. Minister. Um, so, Sir Henry, thank you very much for these group amendments. Uh, relatively rapidly, I would say that uh, there are five types of disagreement we have with these amendments, uh, which are broadly speaking political, philosophical, economic, financial, and constitutional. Uh, the political uh, disagreement uh, is, of course, that this uh, amendment would go right to the heart of this very bill. The entire concept of this bill is to try to effect a change in the current practice and process around whiplash claims by moving uh, the claim limit to £5,000. And that's part of the entire package. The tariffs are related to that, and the small claims limits are related to that. Uh, that then comes on to the philosophical point. Philosophically and fundamentally, we are not arguing that the shift to 5,000 is fundamentally a question of inflation. There are many other reasons why the small claims limit has been moved in the past, indeed in relation to some types of claims. So Henry, as you'd be very aware, is uh, one of our uh, right honourable learned friends. One of the reasons uh, some of the claims have been moved to 10,000 pounds, which of course goes a long way beyond inflation. So largely the driver of whether or not something is a small claims track is to do with the nature of the claim, not the nature of the inflation. However, if we worked on the narrow question of inflation, the judicial college guidelines are currently on RPI as opposed to CPI. But for the arguments, and I, I respect the arguments that the honorable member opposite made, that is not the fundamental argument that the government is making here. This particular amendment would have curious financial implications. It creates a strange syncopated rhythm whereby movements in CPI are not necessarily reflected in the triennial review except in 500 pound increments, which over time mathematically will lead to some peculiar results. But the fundamental reason why we would oppose this amendment is the final argument I made, which is constitutional, which is that really this is business for the Civil Procedures Rule Committee as it always has been, and it is not suitable to put on the face of the bill. So for those arguments, political, philosophical, economic, financial, and constitutional, I would uh, respectfully request that these amendments are withdrawn. Gloria de Piero. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, so what calls? Uh, thank you uh, very much, Chair, for uh, just to make a few uh, very brief uh, comments on this. And I entirely understand, of course, uh, the comments that are made. Now, some of the uh, start of Too, for some cases, particularly commercial cases, uh, the limit's £10,000 uh, already, and those are cases that are very complicated. Um, and the reason why that's possible is simply because, as other members who have practised uh, will realise, uh, that the fact that someone is in a small claims court and isn't represented doesn't mean they are completely unassisted. Uh, the district judges who hear those claims are solicitors or barristers, uh, are extremely uh, competent and extremely experienced in their own uh, right, uh, and therefore there's every reason to believe that they will be able to hear those claims, and that claimants will be able to have uh, justice as their case is heard. I'm very grateful for giving way to this point, but the judges are not there to represent in that case, where a solicitor um, would be there to represent, so that it's comparing apples and pears, does he agree? She's absolutely right. Of course, so I know she has a long history of practicing, as, as do I. That's, of course, absolutely correct. Um, but it doesn't mean that they are simply left to sink or swim uh, on their own. Uh, I mean, I have seen countless cases in my own uh, practice where a district judge, whilst not representing someone, quite clearly points out arguments that may be wished to be made. Uh, district judges frequently bend over backwards to make sure that the correct points are made uh, by claimants. So whilst that's true, Whilst I accept the force of her point, the overall, I'll come in a moment. Uh, whilst that is true, I would suggest um, the overall thrust of enabling justice, but at a reasonable proportion of cost, is one that is being addressed. 
Thank uh, the Honourable Member for giving way. Uh, isn't it right, though, that the fact that increasingly district judges are having to assist litigants in person because people can't get legal representation uh, is actually putting a huge burden on the courts and district judges because actually that isn't their role, uh, but they're increasingly happy to do that, putting an extra burden on them, increasing court costs as a result? Well, of course. She raises an excellent okay, uh, point, and clearly, uh, in cases where judges are having to assist claims, it is likely to take longer. What this comes down to, though, is assuring that uh, claimants who are uh, in cases that are at the lower end of the scale, without for a moment exaggerating the, uh, downplaying the seriousness of people who have been hurt in this way, uh, to ensure that they are able to be heard at a proportionate cost and making sure that the court's resources, and particularly the payment of costs, can go to the higher end of cases because it's ultimately it's the costs burden that is the one that is denying access to justice. Thank you very much. Uh, is it not the case that the panel of district judges responded to the government consultation on this back in 2015 and set out that the courts would actually become clogged with litigants in person if this were to go through because it simply isn't possible for the number of claims that will be brought forward uh, for the district judges to be able to support them. Have the members on the other side read that submission, which is very powerful, and listened to the arguments that the judges are making? Well, whilst I understand the arguments uh, that are made uh, by the judge, by district judges. I do have faith in their ability um, to deal with cases efficiently because I've seen that happen so often uh, in the past. Um, in an ideal world, I would of course prefer that everybody's legally represented because that's more efficient. It means they have someone to uh, argue for them, but it isn't practical within the costs uh, regime in which we live. Uh, Mr Chairman, thank you very much. Um, Sir so, 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 Ruth, Ruth, Ruth George. Thank you very much. And <coughs> I speak uh, as, so, as someone who spent over 20 years working for Shop Workers Union, Usdor, where we saw many claims, both of road traffic accidents and particularly of workplace injuries, where claimants were referred through their union to a solicitor who gave them the support that they needed in order to take a case. And as the Honourable Member for Whitney has set out, actually it's the lawyers in that system who were experienced in this and who often give the advice that claimants need as to whether they, they can take a claim forward or whether it's not worth doing that and therefore actually protect the district judges and the court system and particularly now it's going to be in the small claims courts where we're going to see I think is it projected extra 36,000 extra cases a year which will mean that those district judges with the best will in the world will not be able to cope with the additional workload <laughs> where they're already struggling. That's what the district judges themselves have said in response to the consultation on this, whether the minister chooses to shake his head or not. It's, <coughs> it's also the case that uh, many younger claimants and those who don't have experience of dealing with a legal system will find it very much harder to take a case themselves. And it's not just, uh, written, it's not just a case of compensation up to the levels that we're seeing, the more minor cases. As the Minister said earlier, then this, if this might be the general damages figure, but actually you can make, uh, on the back of that uh, general damages figure, there's also uh, exceptional circumstances payments and there's also compensation for loss of wages. So an individual's total claim might come to a very much higher sum than that which is uh, set by the limit on the small claims sum. And, um, <clears throat> I note that under the whiplash injuries, then someone, even with a claim up to um, two years in duration for their injury, still falls below the £5,000 uh, limit for the small claims limit. So even with an injury that has lasted and possibly disabled them, uh, preventing them from work for two years, where they will not be able to take their case to the general court. They will have to represent themselves through the small claims court and the associated loss of wages could have a huge impact on their lives and on their well-being. So I hope that the Minister will look again at this because it severely disadvantages people who are not so able to take claims through themselves. They often need to have a lawyer to support them and that's what we're arguing for, which also makes the system more efficient <coughs> and more effective.
Lock the doors. <coughs> Jack Brereton. No. Bambus Sherlambus. Aye. Robert Courts. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria De Piero. Aye. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hanson. Aye. Peter Heaton Jones. No. Scott Mann. No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Onasanya. Aye. Ellie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The eyes eight, the nose nine, so the nose habit, the nose habit. Unlock. <coughs> we have already debated clause, new clause three during our debates on clause six. Laura de Piero to move formally. Formally? I'll just say formally. Formally, formally, mm -hmm. formally. Recoverability of costs in respect of advice on medical reports, etc. The question is that clause be read a second time and added to the bill. As many as men please say aye. Aye. The contrary, no? No. I think the no's have it. The no's aye. have it. Aye. Division. Jack Brereton. No. Bamba Sherlambus. Aye. Robert Courts. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria Di Piero. Uh, aye, sorry. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hansen. Aye. Peter Heaton Jones. No. Scott Mann. No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Onasanya. Aye. Ellie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The eyes eight, the nose nine, so the nose have it, the nose have it. Uh, unlock. The next is new clause four. Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Sir Henry. I beg to move new clause four in my name and those of my honourable friends. To understand the importance of our proposed new clause for it's important to understand the importance of the use of periodical payments to compensate those who have been injured through negligence, often catastrophically, with little or no capacity for work and with considerable care costs. More often than not, successful payments are compensated by the payment of a lump sum intended to compensate them for the rest of their life. However, the benefits of periodical payments rather than a lump sum are threefold. First, periodical payments are index linked. So they go up in accordance with, for example, rising costs of living or rising costs of care. Second, in cases such as, the, such as these, there are often arguments about life expectancy. If the court accepts that a victim of a catastrophic injury is likely to live until, for example, 42, but medical advances mean they actually live until they're 80, and if they receive a lump sum, it would have run, it would have run out many years earlier. With periodical payments, the injured person is compensated every year for the rest of their life. Third, receiving an annual periodical payment rather than a lump sum means that injured people do not have to make difficult investment decisions and equally it removes the risk that they will spend the money all at once. The setting of the discount rate is highly relevant to periodical payments. When the rate stood at 2.5%, it would have been far more attractive to, def to defendants to pay a lump sum discounted by 2.5% than to pay index-linked annual payments. This meant, in all but the most serious cases, period periodical payments were often met with huge resistance by defendants. A rate that assumes a much lower level of investment risk by injured people may well see an increase in the use of periodical payments, particularly in cases not at the most catastrophic level, where resistance has been greatest by defendants. Not only are the benefits to the injured person here, but the benefits to the state of not having to pick up the bill in terms of care or housing if and when the money runs out are obvious. At the second reading, the Minister said he welcomed the use of periodical payments. Yet is he able to confirm the percentage of personal injury claims in which they are used, as it is my understanding that the figures are astoundingly low, often due to resistance from defendant insurers? 
New Clause 4 makes it incumbent on the Civil Justice Council, with their expert knowledge, to review the impact of Part 2 and the discount rate on the prevalence of periodical payments being awarded. If we agree that periodical payments are a good thing, surely we can agree that their use must be monitored so that appropriate and evidence-based action can be taken where necessary. This would benefit injured people and benefit the Treasury alike. I move New Clause 4. Periodical payment orders. The question is that the clause be read a second time. Minister. Thank you very much, Sir Henry. Uh, once again, I, I want to uh, perhaps take this opportunity, Sir Henry, of praising the, the Honourable Member for, for Lewisham Western Pench. Um, the arguments made for PPO is very strong arguments. It's absolutely correct. The ideal thing is to give someone a PPO. The problem at the moment about receiving a lump sum with a discount rate is that you could end up being overcompensated or undercompensated. Overcompensated would, of course, be a huge cost to the NHS and the taxpayer. Undercompensated, of course, catastrophic for your lifetime care costs. Whereas the PPO ensures, uh, rather than you taking a lump sum, you simply get the amount of money required in order to look after your costs. Um, we therefore absolutely agree with the nature of this argument. The disagreements with this particular amendment are purely technical. We feel that the 18 months uh, from Royal Offence is too short to take real effect. But as for the basic question that the Honourable Member has raised, whether the Civil Justice Council should look at the use of PPOs and the impact of discount rates on PPOs, we have in fact written directly to the Master of Roles to request the Civil Justice Council to do exactly that at the moment. In other words, look at the use of PPOs at the moment. We remain very open to doing that again once the new review of discount rate is introduced. It's absolutely right we should be encouraging more uptake and challenging the insurance companies who've said publicly that they want more use of PPOs to make sure that more PPOs are given out. That is the correct way or the best way to protect an injured person. There are some narrow cases where it's not appropriate. Somebody may not have sufficient insurance or they may not have the financial weight to be able to deliver a PPO. Uh, but in any case, when it is paid out, it ought to be paid out, and that's why we're very grateful the NHS, for example, continues to use the PPAs in the case of catastrophically injured children. And on that, Mr Chair, I would uh, politely request the amendment is withdrawn. Any reads? Uh, I uh, thank the Minister for that uh, response and, to some extent, the uh, assurances that he has given. However, uh, given that uh, this bill seeks to uh, make uh, big changes. I think that uh, really, uh, if we're committed to periodical payments and their use, then there should be a mechanism for review built into the legislation. So uh, I move to point division. New clause four, as on the amendment paper. The question is that the clause be read a second time. As many as I can say aye. 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 To the contrary, no? No! no. I think the... No! no. Division. Lock the doors. Peter Hittinger. No. Scott Mann. No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Anasanya. Aye. Eddie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Wilde. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. Eyes for eight. The nose nine. So the nose had it. The nose had it. We have a debated clause five. John Adder Bates on clause 10. Flora de Piero to move formally. Formally. Review of assumptions on which calculation of the personal injury discount rate is based. Question is that the clause be read a second time and added to the bill. If there is any opinion, say aye. 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 The contrary, no. No. Aye. 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 Division. Cheryl Ambus. Aye. Robert Courts. 
Chris Davis. No. Florian Piero. Aye. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hanson. Aye. Peter Hatendo. No. Scotsman. No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Undersanger. Aye. Eddie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The eyes eight, the nose nine, so the nose had it, the nose had it. Unlock. We have already debated new clause six, joining the bits on clause eight. Gloria de Piero to move formally. Formally. Passing on savings made by insurers. Questions clause for a second time added to the bill. As many as those say aye. 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 Contrary, no. 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 Aye. aye. Jack Brereton. No. Lambus Sharon Lambus. Aye. Robert Courts. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria De Piero. Aye. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hanson. Aye. Peter Heaton Jones. No. Scott Mann. No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Anasanya. Aye. Eddie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The eyes were eight and the nose nine, so the nose had it, the nose had it. Unlock. We now reach new clause seven, with which it will be convenient to debate new clause eight. Gloria de Piero to move new clause seven. Thank you, Sir Henry. The government has refused to allow the small claims changes which will have a fundamental impact on access to justice for hundreds and thousands of injured people every year onto the face of the bill. New Clause 7 seeks to ensure that vulnerable road users are indeed exempted, as the Minister has promised. New Clause 8 does little more than reflect the recommendations of Lord Justice Jackson in his civil justice review. The Minister this morning agreed that there had been a change to the small claims limit in 1999. New Clause 8 says that 1999 is the date from which any change to the small claims limit should be calculated and that the increase should be by no more than £500 at any one time. As I say, that reflects the recommendations of Lord Justice Jackson. There is a difference between us about what is the appropriate level of inflation. We say CPI and there is absolute logic that it should be CPI because that is the inflation rate that is applied by the government to benefits that are paid to injured people. It is also, of course, the rate that the Governor of the Bank of England recommends. Small claims track, vulnerable road users. The pressure is closed around a second time. Minister. Thank you, Sir Henry. Um, well, Sir Henry, given that we're, we're coming towards the end of the debate, I'd like again to, to pay tribute to uh, honourable and right honourable members on all sides for the quality of this debate. It's been uh, personally quite a testing debate. A lot of very learned friends who have asked a lot of very fundamental questions ranging from inflation rates to the good challenges for my friend, the Honourable Member for Dellen, who keeps me on my toes. Um, but thank you uh, very much for the various contributions. Um, we're now coming in these final group of amendments to uh, questions which relate to some of the debates we've had already, Sir Henry, in different forms. This effectively is a subset of the arguments that were made on New Clause 1. New Clause 1, uh, as Honourable Red Honourable Members will remember, was an argument that the reductions should be made in relation to all personal injury claims. This simply takes the same arguments and applies them to two subsets of people who are injured, vulnerable road users and people injured in the course <coughs> of employment. Um, on both those things, there are both some differences between us again uh, on the correct level to set this rate. But there are also, I think, some important concessions which are worth bearing in mind, which were made both in the Lords and in the subsequent process. Uh, in relation, firstly, to the people injured within the course of employment, personal injury claims which have not been suffered as a result of whiplash, we've listened very carefully to honourable and right honourable members. Uh, they will remember in the initial consultations there were suggestions around raising the limit to £10,000 or £5,000. The agreement has been that for non-whiplash related injuries, this is kept to £2,000. Now there's some sort of discussion about whether it's correct to see that in terms of CPI or RPI, 
But broadly speaking, it is not very significantly different from the rates that were set in the 1990s when inflation is applied, although there is some disagreement between two sides of the House to the extent of a few hundred pounds on the extent of headroom put on top of inflation. There could be a broader argument, uh, which was raised earlier in the debate, about the fundamental principle that the compensation should be paid for the injury, uh, not on the basis of why somebody was present on the scene, whether in the course of their employment or in another activity, but that goes beyond the scope of this amendment. Where the real concessions be made, which I hope uh, members of the opposition will welcome, as well as uh, members of our inside, is of course in relation to vulnerable road users. We've listened very, very carefully uh, to uh, representations made, not primarily by the uh, people who own horses, although I would remind the honorable member that there are nearly uh, there are more than one million horses in the United Kingdom, so it's not quite as much of a minority uh, pursuit as the Honourable Members perhaps implying, but particularly cyclists who have led a very strong campaign uh, arguing that they are particularly vulnerable on roads, and indeed they are. They're not encased in a sheet of metal. And we accepted the argument that the same arguments that apply to cyclists, of course, apply in spades to pedestrians. As a proud pedestrian myself, I feel this very strongly, and indeed to people on a motorcycle who are not themselves encased in metal. Uh, therefore, we are delighted to confirm that both in terms of small claims limit and in terms of the bill itself, vulnerable road users will be excluded. Uh, on that basis, uh, Chair, with many thanks to everybody for their prodigious and learned contributions, I would ask that these amendments politely be withdrawn. Gordon Garrett. I'm going to disappoint the Minister for a final time and move on to division. New Clause 7, as on the amendment paper. The question is that the clause be read a second time. Open say aye. 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 Contrary, no. 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 Aye. Division. <coughs> Lock the doors. Take Brereton. No. Bambus, Cheryl Lambus. Aye. Robert Courts. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria De Piero. Aye. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hansen. Aye. Peter Heaton Jones. No. Scott Mann? No. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Anasanya. Aye. Ellie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The ayes were eight and the nose nine, so the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. We have already debated new clause eight as part of the last group. Gloria de Piero, move formally. Formally. Clark. Restriction on increase in small claims limit for relevant personal injuries suffered by people during the course of employment. Questions at clause bureau a second time added to the bill. As many as have opinions say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. 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 Aye. Aye. Lock my doors. Jack Brereton. No. Bambus Sharalambus. Aye. Robert Courts. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria De Piero. Aye. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hansen. Aye. Peter Heaton Jones. No. Scott Mann. And Manda Billing. No. Fiona Onasanya. Aye. Ellie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy. No. The eyes were eight and the nose nine, so the nose have it, the nose have it unlocked. We have already debated new clause nine during our debates on clause one. Gloria de Piero to move formally. Formally. Clark. Exemption for vulnerable road users and people injured during the course of their employment. The question is that the clause were in a second time and added to the bill. As many as uh, the opinions say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. 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 Aye. 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 <coughs> and lock the doors. Jack Brereton. No. Bambus Sherlambus. Aye. Robert Courts. No. Chris Davis. No. Gloria Di Piero. Aye. Ruth George. Aye. Chris Green. No. David Hansen. Aye. Peter jo Heaton Jones. No. Excuse me. Scott Mann. Amanda Milling. No. Fiona Onasanya. Aye. Ellie Reeves. Aye. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Aye. Joe Stevens. Aye. Rory Stewart. No. Craig Tracy.
No. The eyes were eight, and the nose nine, so the nose have it, the nose have it, unlock. Question is, does clause 11 stand part of the bill? Uh, formally. Question is, does clause 11 stand part of the bill? As many as the members say aye. 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 No. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. We debated Government Amendment 5 earlier in our proceedings during the debate on Clause 8. Minister, to move formally. Formally. Government Amendment 5 proposed to Clause 12 as on the amendment paper. The question is, the amendment be made? As many of us opinions say aye. 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 The contrary, no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. We also debated Government Amendment 6 in our debate on Clause 8. Minister, to move formally. Formally. The Government Amendment 6 proposed to Clause 12 as on the amendment paper. The question is, that the amendment be made. As many as I opinions say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. The question is that clause 12.